Gay men have a higher likelihood of having older brothers than straight men. You might say, oh, does having older brothers make you gay? Well, in a way, yes. So the idea is, is that with first male offspring, the mother develops a particular HY antigen against, you know, or develops, develops antibodies against the antigen that that male fetus has. It increases even more with the second fetus and by the third fetus, this HY antigen, which may interact with a particular part of the brain responsible for sexual orientation and attraction, has its effect on later born males. We've taken this and looked at it in asexuality and found some conflicting findings. So it's not as simple as, you know, a maternal uh, antigen against subsequent, but there is an effect of number of siblings and the sex of those older siblings on asexuality. And we've actually have a study of 2,500 um, people of varying genders where we're just trying to analyze that right now and make some sense of it. Oh my God, that is so interesting. Welcome back to the Rena Malik MD podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Rena Malik, urologist and pelvic surgeon. Today, our guest is Dr. Lori Brado. Dr. Lori Brado is a professor in the UBC Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. She is also the executive director of the Women's Health Research Institute in Canada. She has been involved in Netflix's The Principles of Pleasure and the CBC Gems docuseries, The Big Sex. Talk. She's also authored two mindfulness focused books, Better Sex Through Mindfulness in 2019 and The Better Sex Through Mindfulness Workbook in 2022. Dr. Brado is also a registered psychologist in British Columbia who maintains an active practice helping individuals enhance their sex lives. Today, we talked about how mindfulness impacts sexual desire for both men and women. We also talked about the differences in sexual desire between men and women and the way virtual reality erotica may impact how we treat women with fear around sex. How individuals who identify as asexual compared to sexual individuals pay attention to erotic visual stimuli, as well as about physical versus genital sexual arousal in women. We also covered some interesting facts that are correlated with sexuality, like even fraternal birth order. We hope you enjoy this episode. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Brado. I'm so, so excited about this interview. Um, you are such a uh, influential researcher in the area of sexual health. And so I'm really excited to talk today. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. So, you know, you've done a lot of work in sexual desire and how stress affects desire, but does stress affect desire differently in men and women? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. I mean, first of all, stress levels that are at an all time high. Mm -hmm. We we know that for certain, we know that from what people say. And there's an annual survey that kind of measures the temperature of stress levels in the population every year. And those numbers are going higher and higher. And so it's a, definitely an area of research that people are very interested in. Why are stress levels going up? Uh, what are the main contributors to stress? And that third question that you're asking, which is, are there gender differences in levels of stress? And it turns out, yes, there are. And there's probably both biological reasons in terms of predisposition of our stress response system in women uh, being more predisposed to stress than it is, say, in biological males. But there's also more psychological reasons. And among the various psychological reasons in women, um, holding multiple roles at the same time. So the greater tendency for women to bear most of the brunt of uh, domestic care in the home, as well as holding down jobs and multiple other roles at the same time, volunteering in community, taking care of elders, et cetera, is also contributing to their those higher levels of stress in women than men. What are the biological differences? There's interactions between the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which is that system of our body that contributes to regulating stress so that when a short-term stressor happens, that HPA system kicks in, allows us to be mobilized to manage that stress and then kind of regulate and come back down to normal. The problem is, is that in today's society is that rarely are those stressors kind of one and done. They mm -hmm. tend to be chronic stressors. So it, it's not the case that it's a single major catastrophic event, but rather it's the day-to-day -day stressors, right? It's the chronic to-do list. It's the never-ending thinking in your mind that is actually contributing to some of those chronic stress levels. And so what we've seen over time is that in women, that HPA axis, it doesn't sort of fire and then, and then uh, re-regulate back down to normal. It sort of stays hyperactivated. And one way of measuring 
doing that is looking at cortisol levels, which is one of the major stress hormones. So in a person who's not stressed or in a person who has a well-functioning HPA stress response system, when you wake up in those in the morning, those cortisol levels are high. And by the end of the day, they come down. So you see that kind of slope that comes down in cortisol. But in a chronically stressed person, those cortisol levels are high in the morning and they stay high, um, which again is a sign that our stress response system is not regulated at all. And that's also contributing to that feeling of chronic stress. And that's more more often seen in women than men. Correct. Yeah. And that clearly would then affect desire because we know stress affects desire. And so you may have a couple or a dyad or a partnered relationship where one person and the other person feels like their lives are equally stressful. Yeah. And one may be like, why is your sexual, why don't you want to have sex? Yeah. I'm stressed too, but yeah. I still want to have sex. Yeah. Yeah. So, so absolutely. And there's interactions with that HPA um, system and our sexual response system that is, is very likely different in men and, and in women. The other thing to keep in mind though, is that Gen the genders differ in terms of reasons why we have sex. So men are more likely to say than women, well, stress, uh, sorry, sex helps me relax. So stress can actually serve as a stress reducing tool. Whereas in women, sex might just be yet another thing on the to-do list and actually make women feel even more stressed. So again, there's both kind of biological, physiological reasons as well as more psychological and social reasons why that relationship between stress and desire is quite different in men and women. Why do you think women feel like sex is a chore? Well, it often is. <laughs> so it might be that sex is not pleasurable, mm -hmm. right? And um, so if something doesn't feel good or it's not rewarding or very often if it hurts, right? If sex actually hurts because a woman's not aroused, she's not lubricated, her mind is not present, or she has a chronic uh, bubble vaginal pain condition, then sex itself is not enjoyable, it's not pleasurable, her interest in it is gonna go down. And therefore, sex might be something that she does to maintain the relationship. Mm -hmm. Sex might be something she does to avoid an angry partner. And so in that way, sex very much becomes a chore for mm -hmm. that person. But let's take um, kind of pain and discomfort and lack of pleasure out, um, again, because of what I mentioned earlier about women being more likely. And of course, there's lots of exceptions to this. You know, I certainly don't want to paint a picture that, you know, this is specific to all women and, yeah. and no men, because there's lots and lots of exceptions to this. But, but again, because of what I was referring to about women being far more likely in a dyad to hold those multiple roles sex can be just yet another thing on the to-do list. Mm -hmm. um, and in that growing and never-ending to-do list, unless it's rewarding, unless it gives her something pleasurable, meaningful, joyful, above and beyond all the other things, motivation for it is going to be extremely, extremely low. And that's why in our clinical work, we so often have that conversation. Why do you have sex? What are the reasons for you? And if if a woman can't even give a single answer, that's often where we start. Well, I think those issues are obviously prevalent. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Yeah. We wouldn't you wouldn't have any research to do, right? But I I think that like sometimes even when it is pleasurable or enjoyable, women find it to be a chore. And that's sort of where yeah. I'm getting at is like, yes, women enjoy it in the moment. Yeah. We know there's differences in desire, the way women feel desire sometimes more often to be responsive in nature, meaning yeah. that it doesn't happen right when they see their partner, but they may start developing desire after they're more intimate with them. Yeah. But I wonder then when you, even when you have the positive reinforcement of maybe having an orgasm or having pleasure or feeling yeah. intimacy with your partner, yeah. that still it feels like a chore. Yeah. And so I'm really glad you brought up this kind of distinction between desire that comes out of the blue, right? You just sort of feel like having sex in the moment versus this desire that emerges during a sexual activity. So the distinction between spontaneous and responsive desire. And I think that's a conversation that we really need to be having a lot more with women because so often we all, and certainly I do in my clinical practice, here, you know, women will show up for therapy because they think they're broken because they don't going about their day have spontaneous thoughts of sex. Well, welcome to the club. You are, if you're in a long -term, long term relationship, which we define as anything longer than two years, certainly if you have other responsibilities, kids, job, et cetera, you're not going to feel spontaneous desire. And that's not a problem. And that's why we don't diagnose lack of spontaneous desire 
as as a disorder. We don't. We stop doing that. Our nomenclature mm-hmm. has changed completely. And here again is why it's so important to think about what's in it for you. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's actually work you can do. You can, you can be intentional with exploring and trying on different reasons. Is it something that helps you get to sleep? Is it something that helps you find your confidence? Is it something that helps you change your mood? Is it something that helps you feel more connected with your partner in a way that just sitting down and watching Netflix together does not? So what does sex actually give you? Mm -hmm. And then that's when we bring in all the other tools like mindfulness, being present, eliminating distractions, making sure that you're engaging in pleasurable kinds of exchanges so that during the encounter, it feels good so that desire can emerge, responsive desire can emerge. And that's the way to eliminate this feeling of sex as chore. Yeah. Let's talk about mindfulness because you've done a lot of work on mindfulness and basically shown that mindfulness absolutely improves sexual function in women. I mean, unequivocally. Yeah. And, um, and so what I want to talk about is one, what does that mean for women? What does mindfulness mean? Does that mean they have to be meditating a certain amount of time per day? Or yeah. like, what, is, what does that mean for women? What does it look like to implement mindfulness in your day-to-day? Yeah, yeah, awesome question. Yeah, I've been, I've been um, obsessed with mindfulness as a tool for improving desire, managing pain, improving pleasure for, for more than two decades. So first of all, mind, you know, what is mindfulness? It's a practice right? It's a skill that we actually practice. It doesn't just happen out of the blue. Um, it's born out of meditation, you know, that which has um, Eastern uh, Buddhist roots, and it's been westernized and simplified. So the practice itself involves focusing on something like the breath repeatedly in a non-judgmental way. And so when we do that, when we can focus attention on something and do it with kindness and compassion. We're not judging ourselves as we're paying attention to the sensations of the breath. The brain changes. And we absolutely know unequivocally that there are changes in brain function and changes in brain structure that happen when people repeatedly practice mindfulness. So you have far less activation of the emotion center and the thinking center and far more activation of the center that's in involved in kind of experience, right? Experiential learning. And so how does that translate to sex? Well, first of all, we know that women with low desire specifically, but really you can say any sexual concern, including pain or difficulties with orgasm, there's a, a a much higher tendency to be judgmental. So will I get desire? Will my partner leave me? Oh, just want to get this over with. Will the kids walk in? Is this, is this going to hurt? All of those kinds of um, thoughts, negative thoughts and judgments are far more likely to happen during sex for women with low desire than women who don't have any difficulty. So that's one thing. The brain is already not having sex. Mm -hmm. The brain is consumed in these thoughts. Why does that matter? Well, those thoughts elicit their own emotions, right? Anger, stress, sadness, sometimes guilt, right? Why can't I be normal? Why can't I be like anyone else? And then those thoughts and emotions trigger a whole cascade of other physical and physiological changes in the body impacts on hormones, impact on impact on muscle tension, et cetera, in a way that directly blocks the ability to feel arousal and desire, right? So we know the impact of these negative thoughts and emotions on blocking sexual response. So mindfulness is something that we can practice, not in the bedroom, right? And I often recommend, and we've now studied this in countless studies, that in really encouraging women to develop a daily practice of mindfulness where they actually carve out a little bit of time each day. And it's almost like, you know, doing your daily exercise and going to the gym, but it's a, you're exercising your brain and you're helping your brain much me uh, to be much more able to be present when you want it to present, to be present. So that's the daily practice. And then you can take that same skill and integrate it into sex. So as you're engaging in sexual activity, the moment you notice that your mind is having these negative or judgmental thoughts, the moment you notice that your mind is jumping into the future, will this hurt? Will this be unpleasant, right? Not being present, you can implement those exact same skills and come back. Focus on the breath, focus on the points of contact between you and your partner's body, focus on your heart rate, other other physical signs. And so that's how we put it into practice. When was the last time a doctor spent an hour with you and truly focused on your goals? And when was the last time you left feeling like you really understood what was going on with your body and had a clear plan of what was going to happen next? 
At my practice, Rena Malik, MD, I aim to do just that. I specialize in sexual dysfunction, bladder health, hormone health, and pelvic pain for all people. And I want to revolutionize how we take care of patients. I want to really get to know each and every one of you. That's why at my practice, when you come to see me, I'm 100% present with you for an entire hour. And after you leave, if you forgot to ask me something or need clarification on something we talked about, don't worry. I'll respond to your issues and questions quickly through our secure messaging portal without any additional costs. Just go to www.renamalikmd.com slash appointments and schedule your visit today. We see patients in Irvine and Beverly Hills, California, and virtually for patients from California, Florida, Illinois, Maryland, New York, New Jersey, and Virginia. If you aren't located in these states, consider making an educational visit where we can talk about your conditions generally, but I can't diagnose or treat you. I can't wait to see you. So how many minutes a day? I know you've done it because you've done this in studies, right? So many, many sort of investigated the amount of time people like what are the interventions that you typically recommend? And then, you know, maybe go into the magnitude of changes that people see. For sure. Yeah. So we've we've evaluated this, you know, in three sessions, four sessions, eight sessions in person, online alone in group with a partner um and in our in our groups we deliver in a really structured way so we deliver eight week groups where people are practicing probably 20 to 30 minutes about five days a week that's a lot of practice Mm -hmm. and the reason we do that in a group is because we 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 want people to really understand and experience how this works Mm -hmm. And then what we do after the eight weeks are done is we follow up with them and we ask them, okay, you've gone back into your real life. How much are you actually practicing now? So in our in our biggest randomized uh, controlled trial where we did this, we followed women a year later. At about a year, almost 80% of them were still practicing mindfulness and the average was about 10 minutes a day. That's right? really impressive. It's really impressive. A year impre- later. A year later, 80%. And 10 minutes a day, every single day. And, and we didn't tell them to. We didn't say, we're keep gonna going to follow up, yeah. keep going. But it's because they experience the benefits, not only to their sexual health, but other things like mood and anxiety or mindful eating, um, or just being able to engage in a conversation and be present in their conversation without thinking about myriad other things. So there was that kind of inherent self-reward that came about that they wanted to keep practicing it. I mean, because I think about like exercise interventions or diet interventions, yeah. the the success rate of people continuing with those is abysmal. Yes. So 80% is yeah. like really, really impressive. Yeah. Like people are seeing the benefit day to day. Yeah. You know, you might wonder, wow, why are those rates so high? And I can speculate on lots of reasons, but I think one of the reasons is we don't have a whole lot of other tools in our tool belt when it comes to improving low desire. Mm-hmm. Like really, we don't. Yes, we've got two FDA approved medications that have marginal benefits with significant side effects, um, th- whose benefits stop as soon as you stop taking the flibanserin, mm-hmm. right? So mindfulness as a tool that people can keep using in their life. Um, and then they start to see that, wow, it's it's not just being utilized for this one narrow difficulty I have. I'm actually seeing these benefits in so many other places. So in terms of desire, mm. arousal, orga- orgasm, satisfaction, what are sort of the the changes people see? In this large randomized trial that I mentioned to you, the, the two main things that we were measuring or that we were most interested in was improvements in desire and decreases in distress, mm-hmm. right? So it's not just low desire or difficulties with desire that, that women are bothered by. It's the distress that arises for them from, from that problem. Mm-hmm. The fact that it interferes in their life, the fact that it might impact their mood, gets in the way of their relationship, happiness, et cetera. So in terms of magnitude, and I'll kind of explain this in a statistical way, and then I'll try and translate it. Um, we, we certainly measure statistical changes, but we also measure the magnitude of change by something like an effect size. So the effect size that we found with the drop in distress from before mindfulness to one year later was about a Cohen's D of 1.1, which is massive. Most clinical trials of, let's say, pharmaceuticals for um, improving anxiety or psychological treatments for anxiety have an effect size of about 0.3 to 0.4. Mm-hmm. So this is about three times the magnitude 
at one year later for the drop in distress. That's amazing. Um, the magnitude on desire was still really high, not quite as impressive as distress, but still extremely, high. still a very, very large effect size. And again, it wasn't just at post-treatment, um, but what we found with desire is that th that improvements actually continued to increase. They didn't slip back. Mm -hmm. They continued to have these improvements. Again, we're measuring desire in this responsive way, not out of the blue spontaneous desire, but when you're having sex, how much desire do you have for it to keep going? But I'll, obviously it's reducing the distress of like, oh, I'm, I'm broken Correct. or my partner's unhappy or we're not having enough sex because my partner wants more. All that, those things that come along with it. Correct. Yeah. So those are the two main things that we measured, but then we had a whole list of other things we measured. Relationship, happiness, anxiety, depression, rumination, which is this tendency to kind of obsessively think about one's sexual difficulties. Um, interoception, which is that sense of being able to feel what's happening in your body. And, and, and a lot of women, especially women with low desire, have no idea what's happening in their body. They can't identify the onset of arousal. They can't feel increases in heart rate. And because mindfulness, of course, we're, we're directly teaching people how to be more present in their body, we saw huge increases in their interoceptive awareness. In terms of mindfulness for men, I know you've yeah. done some studies on men, both in men who have psychogenic erectile dysfunction, as well as men with prostate cancer yeah. and, and those sorts of things. So what have you found in the male population? Let's talk about the, that kind of psychogenic situational erectile dysfunction. So these mm. are the men who have no problems getting an erection when they're on their own masturbating put them with a partner and they have a lot of difficulties. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of performance anxiety, a lot of worries, catastrophizing. And um, believe it or not, we did this in group form. We didn't, I mean, the first question we asked is if we offer it, will they come? Or will yeah. there be so much embarrassment that they they won't? And surprising to us um, and quite reassuringly, we had you know, lineups of men wanting to attend the the sessions, delivering mindfulness for situational erectile dysfunction. Um, and it worked. Why? Because we directly addressed that tendency to catastrophize, that tendency to be in that place of, will I get an erection or will I keep my erection? Because that's what mindfulness does, keeps you present. So um, we we also found really great outcomes in, in that study, situational ED. The work with prostate cancer survivors is quite different because mm -hmm. um, for the vast majority of men following nerve sparing radical hysterectomy or other treatments as well. Prostatectomy. Uh, almost all of them. Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> prostatectomy. <laughs> Thank you, not hysterectomy. Um, almost all of them will develop permanent erectile dysfunction. And if not right after surgery, they will within a couple of years. So the mindfulness practice is not about restoring erections. It's about pleasure. It's about reducing distress. It's about how do you expand the repertoire of what you're doing um, sexually to, to enjoy it. And so in that intervention, we actually delivered it to the couple. And we found that buy-in by the survivor's partner was actually really quite important for that that frame shift of you know focusing on the erections and getting the erections back and considering that there's a whole buffet of other different ways of being sexual. Um, so in that study, our main outcome was distress, mm -hmm. and um, and so we saw very very significant improvements in sexual distress, both in the survivors, the prostate cancer survivors, and in their partners. Why? Because there was less emphasis on the penis. There was more enjoyment and experimentation with other kinds of sexual activities. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so much so that now the urologists that we work with in our uh, prostate cancer supportive care program at University of British Columbia are now actually making um, prostate cancer patients aware of mindfulness before they go in for their treatment. Yeah, I will just clarify that not everyone develops permanent erectile dysfunction after a prostatectomy. It's usually about 15% um, develop some degree of erectile dysfunction that doesn't recover. I think that's that's really interesting in terms of accepting sort of the difficulties with erectile dysfunction because we don't talk about that enough. And I think um, it is really challenging in today's society uh, to say, I can still have pleasure yeah. without an erection. I can still provide pleasure to my partner. And right. I sort of have this discussion with my patients often, but I still get a lot of pushback. And yeah. I think that is really challenging. And I'm glad that your urologists who are offering prostate cancer therapy are talking about yeah. it. Yeah, you know? us too. It's, it's been a bit of a paradigm shift for them, but they're also looking for other tools to offer their, to their patients who are, who are suffering. And it's not for everyone. 
right? Because there there certainly are some patients that simply just don't want to do these things. They want to keep pursuing other pharmacological or mechanical means of restoring erections. Um, but for those who are even just a little bit curious or have partners who are mostly curious can be a great adjunct. Yeah. I think the other thing I would say is there's there's sort of like a whole host. I think, first of all, I think anyone with erectile dysfunction, whether it's organic, predominantly organic, uh, meaning it's from the body, a problem with the body, could benefit from mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Because I tell all my patients with sexual dysfunction, whatever it is, that no matter what is wrong with you physiologically, there's always a brain component because yeah. it stresses you out, of right? It can yeah. be devastating yeah. to not function appropriately yeah. in a domain that is so important day to day. Yeah. And so while I don't know if you've done studies in everyone, you know, every specific sexual dysfunction domain, but I always tell people I think they could benefit overall from yeah. reducing stress, increasing mindfulness, because everyone has a problem in the brain, regardless of whether they have a problem elsewhere in their body, exactly. because it's going to affect your brain. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. I'm I'm really glad you make that point because you know I think historically we used to think there was the brain and there's the body, and those two two things are quite separate. This kind of Cartesian dualism yeah. idea, and yet every thought we have in our brain has a counterpart in the body right? Some subtle, either physiological or neuroendocrine or hormonal change, et cetera. Um, and changes in the body directly impact the brain. We have thoughts about it. We might have emotions about it, et cetera. So yeah, I'm really glad that that, that kind of brain, brain, brain body connection is emphasized. Yeah. And I think honestly, I mean, think about mindfulness, right? You're yeah. not doing anything besides thinking, right? You're yeah. focusing your thoughts, you're, you're changing the way your brain works. And it is so powerful, not just in sexual function, but in multitude of areas that can, can reduce blood pressure, it can yeah. improve physiologic yeah. abnormalities. And so it is just amazing to me. And I, I really like I tell people these benefits, and I definitely get a lot of pushback, like, uh, I don't have time to meditate, or I don't want to be this sounds too frou frou for yeah. me. So what are things you tell? Yeah, patients? terrific. Uh, because my patients will say the same thing. Um, so the first thing is, uh, you know, thankfully, we've got a ton of science. Mm -hmm. And the number of peer reviewed publications evaluating mindfulness for everything from chronic pain to managing anxiety to mindful eating to obviously many domains of sexual health and beyond um, is very, very impressive. There's an mm -hmm. entire journal of mindfulness um, and some some fairly good funding to support these, these empirical trials. So that's one thing I always stand behind is the data. And the data don't lie, especially when studies come from multiple different centers around the world, all looking at the same thing. So that's one thing. The thing around time is uh, is valid. And we are, we're not going to create time for people in the same way that we're not going to create time for them to exercise or engage with their family or do other meaningful things. And so it's about priorities, right? Mm -hmm. It really is about what, where is there some wiggle room in your day that you can implement this? Because although mindfulness is a simple practice, all we're doing is paying attention non-judgmentally, it's not easy, yeah, right? And the not easy part comes with carving out the time. Yeah. And 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 sticking with it, and so the one of the, th the strategies I often use is I'll say, you know, you're already here, you've already shown up in my office. Why not commit to four weeks? Right, a month goes by really quickly, and then let's reevaluate then and see how it goes. Yeah, and do you tell them to just start with small amounts of time, like yeah. five minutes a day, and then yeah. slowly work their way up? Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thankfully, there are so many um, apps and other digital health tools, or you can even hop on YouTube and download ten to forty-five minute mindfulness. I've I've got several of them uh, recorded on my website too, but but ensuring that you carve out the time in the day so that you know what time of the day tomorrow is my mindfulness practice going to happen, and then keep a log, keep a log of what time of the day. What was the experience like? What helped you remain present? What maybe got in the way so that we can make those adjustments going forward? Do you think people can practice mindfulness without like traditional meditation? I, mean, I know they can, but do you think it's as effective? So for example, having a conversation like this where we're really mindful, right? Yeah. I'm not daydreaming about something else. Yeah. I'm really present. And, and similarly, like just even doing the things you're doing, like say you are um, you know, you are having a conversation or say you are going for a walk and just being really mindful of like the sounds around you or, or the way your foot hits the ground. Like, yeah. can you begin to incorporate that? And will it still be as effective as actually doing like maybe a mindfulness 
meditation? Yeah, that's the golden question that actually has been studied. So what we know is that um, people who actually adopt a formal mindfulness practice where they carve out the time and they, they, they really practice the skills, that then allows them to be more mindful in their life in the same way that if you exercise and you go to the gym, then when you're at home and you bend over to pick up the can of tuna that fell on the ground, you're going to do so in a way that's going to lessen the chance of, you know, throwing your back out. So that's the kind of day-to-day -day implementation of the mindfulness skills. Um, but it's probably not the case that just incorporating mindfulness in your day is, is going to have those same quite powerful effects that we saw in distress and desire for someone who really struggles in that area. Maybe it does for people without any sexual difficulties, but that's what we want to get to, right? We don't want mindfulness to just be a, a, a skill homework that you do on the pillow. We want people to live more mindfully, mm -hmm. right? So that when you are having a conversation, when you are eating, when you are watching your kid's soccer game, you're there. And I mean, what's been fascinating is this whole other cognitive science literature, which shows the impact of multitasking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when people are multitasking, they're think, they think they're getting through everything quicker and better and through their to-do list. And yet we actually know that people are more likely to make mistakes. The brain is slowing down. There's less enjoyment. And you actually save time in your day when you do things one thing at a time. So we kind of need to lose this idea that mindfulness is a waste of time. Right. And, 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 tr and again, if you don't believe me, just look up the science. I mean, the science is pretty, pretty clear on this question and it ends up saving you time. Yeah. It makes you more productive, right? Yeah. If you are mindful that that 20 to 30 minutes of mindfulness a day can pay dividends yeah. over the course of your day and lifetime. Yeah. In terms of um, desire, um, you've done some work very recently on virtual erotica mm -hmm. and how that affects desire. So I know this is sort of an emerging area yeah. um, and we don't really know yet. I know this is sort of early on, but what did you find? You know, virtual reality, which is kind of, you know, the next frontier of where, where uh, a lot of um, these kind of healthcare innovations is going to go. And in the domain of anxiety or specific phobias, it's been an incredibly powerful tool. So as an example, people who have a fear of flying and completely avoid flights, well, you can put them on a in a virtual environment, a simulator, where they actually experience all the same feelings of buckling in the seatbelt, taking off, being in the air, and then simultaneously teaching them anxiety reduction strategies like progressive muscle relaxation. It's been an incredible tool for helping overcome those kinds of phobias. So we've actually been interested in applying this to um, women and people with vulvas who have a fear of vaginal insertion. So mm -hmm. traditional, what we call, what we might call vaginismus, where there's a real fear. So these are the women who are afraid of tampons, avoid gynecologic exams, you know, uh, either avoid or undergo with a lot of anxiety, vaginal insertion and sex and other kinds of activities. And, um, while there are some evidence-based treatments from a psychological approach, the traditional treatment that we use involves teaching them relaxation and then sending them home with uh, progressive inserts. So vaginal inserts of a small size and they sort of work through while they're managing anxiety at the same time. So the mm -hmm. challenge has been for those women where anxiety is so high, they get home and they just freeze. They avoid the activities altogether. So what we've done is we've, kind of created a virtual environment through VR, VR headset, where um, they actually are exposed to these erotic scenes. We're teaching them relaxation at the same time, and they're all in the safety of our research lab at mm. our healthcare center. Mm -hmm. So we've done two proof of concept studies that show that has shown that in women with vaginism as compared to controls, we had 40 in each group we can indeed elicit very realistic levels of fear and anxiety and immersion equivalent to the levels that they feel at home. And what we're about to start now is we just got some uh, funding from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research is to actually um, try this in our clinical setting. So we're exposing them to that VR environment. Um, they can control what they're seeing. And then they also have at the table with the table beside them is a small vaginal insert. And they can actually experiment while they're in this scene with using the vaginal insert, again, all in the safety and privacy of our office. So if this works, 
this could be an incredible tool later on. Uh, we know there's much more inexpensive VR headsets that people can buy and, you know, practice these kinds of things at home. So again, super innovative, a lot of fun. And if this works, I think that we can also experiment with this with other kinds of sexual concerns as well, where there's that fear component. Yeah, that is really exciting and fascinating because that plays a huge role in a lot of, uh, a lot of people with sexual dysfunction. And I mean, that could be transformative. Yeah, let's hope. <laughs> yeah. um, you've also done some work on attraction and mm -hmm. sexual attraction versus romantic attraction yeah. in both men and women. And you've actually found differing results in what drives both sexual and romantic attraction in genders. Yeah. So most of that research comes out of my interest in differentiating asexuality from low desire. Mm -hmm. So asexuality is the individual who has absolutely no sexual attraction. They also have no desire for sex. So what that means with absent, absent attraction is there's nothing, there's no person, there's no thing, there's no stimulus that elicits that motivation for sex mm -hmm. versus a person with low desire still has attractions. There's still things that, you know, potentially turn them on. They just don't have desires for sex. And the reason why the distinction between those two groups is so important, it's in fact, it's critical, is because asexuality is a sexual orientation. It's not a sexual dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Folks folks who are ace don't want treatment. They're not bothered by their lack of attraction. Right. And thankfully, increasingly uh, among uh, sort of LGBT uh, to QIA plus groups, they're recognizing asexuality as again, part of that sort of sexual orientation spectrum mm -hmm. yeah. versus the person with low desire who wants treatment is bothered by that. So that's kind of the the underpinning of, of my interest in attraction. So we've done several large studies where we've compared large samples of people um, who identify as asexual versus low desire, um, looking at sexual attraction versus romantic attraction. And one of the really interesting findings among that group is, you know, people can still have romantic attraction, want all of the non-sexual things that come in a relationship, companionship and trust and uh, security and safety and someone to talk to without the sex, right? Yeah. So one can have romantic attraction without sexual attraction. And that's more likely in women mm. than in men, mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. sort of what's underpinning some of those gender differences in romantic versus sexual attraction, that it's an area of study that we need to do more of. Yeah, I think it's really fascinating on how um, those sort of attr those attraction measures can kind of lead to mate preference, right? Like yeah. what you are. Uh, what your sexual attraction is versus your romantic attraction, they can be very different. Yeah. And they, they sort of set up a way in which we choose our mates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah, fascinating area that clearly we have a lot more research to do. In. Yeah, but I, you know, I think it's because we know a little bit in the animal in the animal world, but yeah. not as much in the human yeah. um, in the human condition. You know, and I was going to bring up asexuality. It's, it's a relatively uncommon identity. One percent is in the literature. Maybe it's more than yeah, that. It's but, a bit higher now as yeah. as we're studying it more. Yeah. But, but still quite low, probably about five percent. And you looked at one study where you looked at like they you looked at eye tracking. Yeah. In in uh, visual erotica. Yeah. And, and sort of erotic stimuli, and you found that there was actually a true difference yeah. in in not only asexual versus people who identify as normal sexuality, uh, but even those with low desire versus yeah. versus normal sexuality. Yeah, yeah. So the eye, you know, why eye tracking? People might wonder, well, what is eye tracking going to tell you? So eye tracking can be a bit of a biomarker into underlying genetic predetermined um, contributions to this. So eye tracking has has been a tool that we've used for a long time to study sexual uh, attraction in say gay men versus, versus um, folks who are attracted to the opposite sex. And eye tracking can be a very reliable indicator. There's lots of other biomarkers, even pupil dilation or fraternal birth order or things like that. And so um, because we've done so much research trying to understand the psychological experiences of people with asexuality, um, we thought, well, let's start to look at some of these biomarkers. So again, among one of them was, was 
sort of eye tracking and visual preference. And what we found was that the asexual people were far less likely to fix their gaze on the more erotic zones in, say, an erotic scene. So a scene of a person masturbating or a scene of a couple having sex. The ace folks were spent far less time. So their initial gaze to that area, but also the amount of time that they spent there was significantly less than people who don't identify as asexual. So what does that mean? I mean, we sort of need to do more studies, but, um, you know, there is, there. I think there's, an, there's a growing case uh, to be made that just like other sexual orientations, asexuality is also something that has genetic, pre-genetic, prenatal uh, origins. It's not, it's not a choice that people make. It's not celibacy, in other words. Yes. Yes. You said fraternal birth order. How does that, how is that a, a biomarker? Yeah. So this isn't my main area, though. We've done quite a bit of research in this area. So for a long time, um, the finding and the explanation was, so gay men have a higher likelihood of having older brothers than straight men, right? Mm -hmm. So you might say, oh, does having older brothers make you gay? Well, in a way, yes. But the underlying hypothesis, the, the kind of leading hypothesis right now is the maternal immune hypothesis. Mm -hmm. So the idea is, is that with first male offspring, the mother develops a particular HY antigen against, you know, or develops, develops antibodies against the antigen that that male fetus has. It increases even more with the second fetus. And by the third fetus, um, this HY antigen, which may interact with a particular part of the brain responsible for sexual orientation and attraction has its effect on later born males. Now that theory is still, you know, it's not unequivocal. There's some conflicting data, but that's kind of the hypothesis. And so we've we've taken this and looked at it in asexuality and found some conflicting findings. So it's not as simple as, you know, a maternal uh, antigen again subsequent, but there is an effect of number of siblings and the sex of those older siblings on asexuality. And we've actually, we're unpacked, we have a study of 2,500 um, people of varying genders where we're just trying to analyze that right now and make some sense of it. Oh my God, that is so interesting. Like yeah. <laughs> literally very, very fascinating. Are you loving the Rena Malik MD podcast? Well, I love each and every one of you and I'm truly honored that you choose to spend a bit of your day or a bit of your week with me. Did you ever hear the actual story of why I started making content online? Well, when I was a resident, I remember having a patient who had bladder cancer. And in order to treat her bladder cancer, we had to remove it and then reconstruct a new bladder called an Indiana pouch. Now with this new bladder, she would have to catheterize herself through a stoma or an opening on her abdomen in order to empty her bladder. So after surgery, immediately she did great. She went home and no major issues. But subsequently over the next couple months, she started getting readmitted over and over again to the intensive care unit. And we were really wondering what was going on. Eventually, we figured out that she didn't truly understand that she now had to catheterize herself to empty her bladder. Just the simplest thing that was so pivotal, she didn't understand that. And it was then that I realized as a urologist, I could do the perfect surgery. But if my patient didn't understand the consequences of that surgery, then I failed as their doctor. And once I started practice, I realized that I couldn't teach people everything they needed to know in the 15 or 30 minutes I saw them in my office. And that's when I started creating all my Rena Malik MD content to offer free education to people around the world. And I can tell you that it has been truly one of the most rewarding experiences in my life. And in order to keep providing free content, we need your help. If you are getting value out of this podcast or my other content, I encourage you to join our premium membership. As a member, you'll get early access to the audio and video of the podcast completely ad-free, transcripts of all the episodes, and exclusive access to Ask Me Anything episodes that occur once a month. And during those episodes, I answer questions that are asked only by premium members. So join us today at renamalik.supercast.com. Can't wait to see you there. In terms of desire versus arousal, and there was some work you did on how arousal in women, both subjective arousal and physical arousal, there is some concordance. So maybe talk about what, yeah. how is arousal different from desire? Most people don't know what that means and, and how that's different and how um, that plays a role. 
Yeah. So I love how um, the late Ellen Lon, who's a dear colleague and mentor um, in the field, talked about the relationship of desire and arousal. And she explained it as two sides of the same coin, right? So to kind of simplify that even further, you know, desire is the interest in sex and arousal is the actual physical and, and emotional experience that happens during sex. And I, and I mean sex in the broadest sense. I don't just mean penis and vagina sex, but it might be other kinds of, of um, self-touching or other kinds of sexual activity beyond penis and vagina. So they have a relationship with one another, um, but they're not exactly the same thing. Now, we've, we and many others have done qualitative work where, we, where we've asked women to talk about the differences between desire and arousal. And if you were to ask a random sample of women walking down the street, most of them would have a hard time differentiating desire from arousal. Unlike in males, where um, arousal is very often synonymous with erection mm -hmm. and desire is, well, I want to act on that erection by having sexual activity. So that's the link. And um, and we are, we're, we're measuring those in distinct ways when we do research to try and understand, does a particular treatment impact one or the other or both of them at the same time? Yeah, and I think a lot of people think arousal is just lubrication in women. And it's yeah. much more complex. It's much that. more complex. And actually, our, our colleagues who've studied the relationship between lubrication and desire uh, with a, a little vaginal um, a, a vaginal swab that's inserted often find minimal relationship between extent of, lubri of actual lubrication, not awareness of lubrication, but actual lubrication and levels of sexual desire. So we need to be really careful. The flip side of that, is when we are uh, when we talk to patients who may have been in in unwanted non consensual sexual situations, and they may have been told, "Well, you were lubricated, you were wet, therefore that conveyed you wanted it." Mm -hmm. And the only way to know if a woman wants it is to ask her. Right. Don't rely on lubrication. Don't rely on anything the body is doing to convey her consent. Absolutely, because women lubricate for all sorts of different reasons, and it's a it's a protective mechanism at some point exactly. that that women will lubricate to protect their bodies. Yeah, um, even if it's if if they're having an unwanted sexual experience, they still don't want to get hurt. Their exactly. body is trying to protect them, um, and so it is not an indicator of desire, as you mentioned. Uh, but it is interesting that when you're um, when you're in a wanted sexual encounter, that desire and arousal tend to be concordant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and so we've we and others have we have a sexual psychophysiology lab in my um, at my home institution where you know you bring women into a private room in a reclining chair, you expose them to erotic films, and then you measure everything you possibly can. You measure her physiological response with a vaginal photoplethysmograph, which is an indicator of well, it's a it's somewhat of an indicator of physiological arousal. You can measure what her mind is doing by putting something like a little lever affixed to the uh, arm of her chair and she's moving it back and forth in a way that corresponds with how mentally turned on she is. Then you can give her questionnaires to fill out before and after a film to tap into things like desire. How much did you want to have sex? And we often repeat those measures, at least the the self-report ones three days later. So the idea being when they come into the lab and they have this arousal experience, does it trigger desire when they leave and when they go home, mm -hmm. right? So is the experience of arousal more likely to trigger a motivation? Let's go into like a little nerdy sort of yeah. discussion about what is a vaginal plethysmograph and what does it do? Yeah, so vaginal photoplethysmograph is a little glass probe that um, has a photo emitting diode, basically uh, a little sensor that emits a pulse of light and that pulse of light. So the woman comes in, she inserts, it looks just like a tampon, but it's mm -hmm. glass. Mm -hmm. She inserts it into her own vagina, um, reclines back in a chair, and there's a long cable that feeds out of that photoplethysmograph probe. And it goes through the wall into the next room, into an amplifier on the other side. And so the idea is, is that when there's physiological arousal, the amount of light that is is scattered off the vaginal wall shifts. So the more arousal, the more the bend in that light. And so that's what's being picked up. So that's why I say it's an indirect measure. Is of, that because of blood flow? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the more blood flow you get, the more the light is scattered. That's exactly right. Okay. And then the one thing I wonder in all these studies is self-report. So mm -hmm. 
you know, when there's, um, there was one study where they looked at um, how much women self-reported desire, masturbation, um, and sexual desire for different types of sexual activities. And they com- put them into three different categories. One was they were told that um, their their results would be blinded. Nobody would know who, uh, like nobody except for the research team would see the results. One was like you'd be attached to a lie detector test. And one would be that your peers would see it. Mm-hmm. And they responded very differently. So when they knew that it was just the research team and nobody would know who they were or what they were saying it was much more synonymous to their male counterparts but when they knew they were going to a lie detector and the lie detector similarly but when they knew their peers were going to see it they less often talked about their desire and arousal and then the other thing is that you know women tend to want to uh, so not all women. Let's let's be. Some people tend to be people pleasers, and they want yeah. to give you the answers that you want. Like, oh, this should be causing desire. So, so I'm gonna say it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot going on in that study. One is, I mean, let's be honest, when we, when a lot of those studies measure sexual response and sexual function, they do so in an artificial environment, right? So in my environment, um, although I'm in an academic healthcare center in a department of gynecology, um, it's still an artificial environment. It's not their home environment. And so there's always that bit of bias, even though they, they have total privacy in that room and we re reassure them that whatever they respond, there's no impact on us. They're going to get their remuneration regardless of how they respond. Um, And at the same time, a lot of studies are done in undergrad university samples of, you know, average age 19, Mm -hmm. where there is a higher likelihood of number one, people doing this for the money or for the course credit. And it's a unique group, right? Mm -hmm. So these are college kids away from home for the first time, probably more sexual activity, probably more desire. So not the most generalizable sample. So um, so we we need to be really careful in our methodologies of how we do these studies. And that's why I think clinically applied research with real patients and real people is ultimately so important and and really hard to do at the same time. So we need to make sure we fund it. Yeah, and I mean, we know that there are some maybe physiologic differences in how we respond to watching an erotic film versus actual intercourse, yeah. right? Like there's different changes in, in brain hormone findings and, and things yeah. like that. So that's sort of the challenge, I think. I mean, yeah. since Masters and Johnson, I'm not sure there's many people who've been doing studies actually watching uh, couples fornicate or not fornicate. in North America. Yeah. yeah, there's a few there's a few sites in Europe mm-hmm. where the research ethics boards allow that. It's not going to happen in North America. Well, at least not in Canada and the U.S. <laughs> it's yeah. not allowed. People can masturbate in the lab. Yes. Um, and uh, we know sites in Montreal, Canada, where that's that that's the focus of their research is having people masturbate in the lab. But even that, there's a lot of effort that has to go in getting ethical approval to get those studies approved. Yeah. Yeah. That's... Um would be ideal. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't it? <laughs> it would be really. But, weird. you know, it kind of speaks to this larger societal hang up that we still, we, well, not you and I, but others still have around sex. And, mm. you know, anytime uh, the NIH or other groups fund sex research, there's always a, a faction of society that rally together and they protest it. They, they they see the funding of sexuality research as a as a harm as a harm to children it's a harm to society um, and so the fact that you know we still have that to this day is a real problem and it suggests we need better sex education in schools we need politicians who are savvy in talking about the benefits of talking about sex mm-hmm. um, we need to get a handle on reducing sexual assault rates etc um, and and uh, yeah it's a collective effort it's not just the onus yeah. is not just on the scientists and the clinicians to I do I mean, this. if you really cared about children, like let's lobby, uh, you know, and get better sexual education. Let's, yeah. like, those are the things that we should be doing. And instead yeah. we're fighting sexual research. Like that doesn't even make sense, I, right? I couldn't agree more. And, and sex is the backbone of society. Yeah. You cannot reproduce and have more children, which is going to propagate the future of society without sex, right? right? And you're not right. going to, if you're unhappy or not enjoying sex, you're less likely to yeah. have children, right? Exactly. Like, let's like, let's be yeah. at the basis. No one can argue with that yeah yeah um but we could talk about that all day <laughs> <laughs> yes we could hopefully so, there's some politicians and decision makers listening to this yes reach out <laughs> please reach out we will be happy to help you and and champion some of this advocacy uh because it is so important yeah so important tell me is there something that we haven't talked about that you feel like people need to know 
I mean, we haven't talked about cross-cultural differences. Um, we haven't talked about what about um, females who don't af- identify as women, you know, g- um, gender diverse, non-binary, or even trans men. So mm-hmm. assigned female at birth who identify as men today. And those are areas where we have far, far less research. We don't actually have a population-based prevalence study on the rates of low desire in trans men versus non-binary females versus cisgender women. So that's an area we need to do more in. And we we also know that there are systemic barriers that prevent those groups, but also racialized groups. I do a lot of work in Vancouver with South Asian women, black women, indigenous women, really trying to understand what are the barriers preventing them from seeking care. Systemic racism is a huge one. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's, you know, we, we, I think we can't have any topic about sexual health without naming that that, and acknowledging that. And uh, because those barriers mean that those women are less likely to get help. It might mean that they're, uh, they suffer with their symptoms for far longer mm-hmm. and then it takes a toll on many other aspects of their life. So, so this is a collective effort and it's a commitment to over, overcoming barriers and systemic racism to make sure that these underserved groups um, are heard. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, we had a really interesting lecture yesterday. So we attended the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health uh, this week together. And um, there was an interesting talk, lunch talk yesterday about uh, non-Abrahamic religions and how uh, their, their views on sexuality have formed based on historical underpinnings. And it was really fascinating to see that, you know, I always joke that the Kama Sutra came from India, but yet we're so, we don't talk about sex mm-hmm. as a South Asian. And mm-hmm. um, and it's actually very fascinating. The history is very fascinating, but also um, it, is, it is very difficult for most people to... Um, um, to to know how to talk to these particularly women, South Asian women who may have sexual dysfunction, particularly in the in the older population that where they're just re- or recently immigrated from India yeah. or or any part of South Asia, because they're like if you were like let's let's you know why don't you try masturbating? They'd be like, oh no, yeah, oh no, I just want to be able to have sex without pain. Yeah, um, I want to be able to do it so my partner's you know relatively satisfied. But that's it. Like there's yeah. there's no connotation of pleasure. Yeah in terms of sexuality. And I think there's a lot of people working on providing good education to South Asian women in India, which I think yeah. is really helpful, but there's a lot of work to be done. And in particularly in understanding these populations yeah. and their thoughts around sex are very different from the traditional um, North American views on sex. Yeah. And so I think that is really, really important. If you are in a relationship with someone in these situations, it's also important to realize their thoughts about sex are yeah. very, very different. It's going to take some time and really dedicated effort to figure that out and yeah. figure out ways. And they have to want that to actually improve their sexual function. Yeah. yeah love it. Love that you've that you've you've named that yeah so that's you know that's more work for all of us to do and i mean i'd love to see medical schools and graduate programs um dedicating more funding so that those underserved students get into those programs yeah. right so that we have more indigenous students more black women uh, and others um, who can then be a champion in their society for these areas of care yes and there's so many stereotypes um about black women and, and Hispanic women yeah. and, uh, you know, minorities in terms of sex that, that yeah. really need to be um, changed and, and, and we need to teach about it in yeah. schools. Yeah. And the interesting thing, I was talking to Dr. Gordon yesterday about how she went, became a, a sex therapist and got this additional education to be a sex therapist in addition to going to medical school. And so the program that she went to at NYU no longer exists. And mm-hmm. to her knowledge and my knowledge, there's no... Um, no specific degree in sex, talking to patients about sex in terms of sex therapy for doctors. Yes. And there's That's no right. specific like fellowship or anything that you can do. And and we don't learn about it in medical school. Yeah. Like there is no, we learn about the physiology of sex. Yeah. We learn about, and if you're lucky, you may come across someone like myself or Dr. Rachel Rubin or, or some, you know, a, a leader in female sexual health who's going to talk about, you know, how to examine uh, the entire vulva appropriately and assess you know, the clitoris and assess yeah. other things. But if you don't, like you will go throughout medical school and you will know very, very little about 
uh, the psychological underpinnings of sex, which are so, so powerful. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why having conferences and other opportunities like you and I both enjoyed over the last few days um, doing that and, 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 uh, but also recognizing what are your own blind spots, right? And so if you don't recognize what your own blind spots are and examine your own biases and prejudices, even though none of us want to do that, but we know that all of us have implicit biases. Mm -hmm. um, so without doing that kind of introspective work, we are, we're not kind of in a position to make change and be open to learning and doing better and learning from those communities. So, yeah. So, you know, I think as a, as a sex researcher, I think in some domains we've made massive strides and, you know, thanks to the, the approval of Viagra in 1998, it really opened the door for this whole field of studying and researching female sexual function. Yet there's other domains where we're still in the dark ages and have a lot more to do. So, yeah, a lot of work to be done. And hopefully if anyone listening gets inspired, we can, you know, we can continue to work together. We end all of our podcasts with some questions that we ask everybody. So what is something you know now in your life that you wish you knew earlier? Oh, that, um, you know, I think, I think personally, cause I, I love mentorship and in my, in my leadership role, I, I, um, uh, I'm the executive director of women's health research Institute in British Columbia is the power of young people finding their voice. And, um, I wish I knew then that that feeling of imposter syndrome, wasn't real, that it was just a sign of me progressing. And so I, I really take it upon myself to meet and mentor young people and helping them find their voice and find their leadership and move on. So I could have spared myself maybe two decades of, of agony and self-doubt if I had known that at 20. <laughs> yes. I mean, I think part of it is that's a normal uh, normal response yep. is to feel imposter syndrome. Everyone does. Yep. And I feel the same way very, very similarly in yeah. why I mentor medical students and yeah. residents and feel like it's so, so important to say, guess what? You're not alone in feeling yeah. this. We all yeah, do. Exactly. We all do. I still do every yeah. day. You yeah. Know? What's a, what's a non-negotiable something you have to do every day? Uh, meditation. Yeah. yeah. So I do, I do take, there are days of the week where my meditation is longer. Um, actually at the BC Women's Hospital that I work at, we have a meditation community every Thursday at 1235. It's open to anyone who wants to log on. We have, you know, physicians, educators, and everyone who log in um, and take a, you know, a brief pause out of their day. And then I integrate it into my my days, both in a formal practice, but also in an informal practice. Do you ever do like uh, maybe 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes later, or is it always yeah. in one sitting? It is what, what does my day look like and where can I make this happen? Just like exercise, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have 10 minutes to get it done and other times you have a lot more time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's a health hack or life hack you would share? Um, keep positive people in your life. Um, and by positive, I mean people that you look up to and inspire you and are authentic with you and you can be authentic with. I think, you know, the friendships that I have now in my late forties, um, I I've never had before. And it's, and it's that sort of mutual sharing of vulnerability and it's an incredible fountain of, of just feeling validated and authentic. Yeah, when you find good people, hold on to them yeah, tight, you know, yeah. and sh show them your appreciation. Um, and then lastly, what's one thing you would change about the world if you could? Systemic racism. Yeah. And I mean, there's so much, but I think systemic racism really underpins a lot of um, violence, prejudice, unemployment rates, lack of housing, poverty, et cetera. A lot of it has its roots in systemic racism don't know how, don't know how long it will take. Um, but I do feel like, you know, with a, a collective effort that this is something we can really, really chip away at. And hopefully it ends in my lifetime. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I think I talk about this um, privately with my friends a lot and my colleagues and uh, my partner, but I think we have to realize that the majority group and whatever whatever particular group you're looking at will always have a head up and you have to yeah. let that, you have to be okay with getting rid of, letting go of that power yeah. to allow systemic racism to end. So realizing yeah. your own involvement in systemic racism, even myself, we're like the token minority, right? The model yeah. minority. And so we have to let go of that view of being the model minority to allow systemic racism to end. And yeah. so I think um, there's a lot of work that every single person can do yeah. to, to reduce it. Yeah, couldn't agree more. 
Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It's been so lovely to have you. And my pleasure. Uh, where can people find you? So um, I my uh, handle is Dr. Lori Brado, and our research team is at UBCSHR. So it stands for University of British Columbia Sexual Health Research. And we use our research page to really disseminate a lot of the science that we and others are doing. And uh, my website, lauriebrado.com. If anyone's interested in downloading the meditations that I've recorded, you can find them there. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to today's episode on the Rena Malik MD podcast. If you're enjoying this podcast, an easy zero cost way to support us is by rating and reviewing this podcast on your favorite podcast platform and subscribing to our channel on YouTube. This allows us to spread free evidence-based education to more listeners each and every week. You can find me on social media on all the platforms at Rena Malik MD, including YouTube, X, TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. And as always, remember to take care of yourself because you're worth it.